church we're glad that you're here this morning thank you for taking the time to change the time and to be here on time uh, how many of you knew what time it was when you walked in the building you were good anybody surprised when you came in the building today good 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 our, I think our phones are helping us in that but uh, we're glad that you're here happy to see some folks for the very first time today Sharon is here with us this morning and we're glad that you've come her kids have been with us for some time, but uh, we're glad that she's here. And I see some other faces that I don't recognize. And so uh, I'm going to run to you after the service to say hello and to meet you. And I hope that our Bible Baptist family does the same. If you are here for the first time, please, if you got one of these little blue pieces of paper, fill it out so we know who you are. Uh, we promise not to bombard you with a bunch of spam, but we'd like to know who you are and at least send you a thank you note for coming today. Let's stand together, take our hymnals, turn to page number 474. Only a sinner saved by grace. If you've come today thinking, well, this is a room full of perfect people, you've come to the wrong place. Uh, you've come to a place where we know what we are. We are sinners saved by the grace of God. Not have I not
My perspective is different this morning, and uh, thank you for singing. Several prayer requests, as you know, um, Pastor Parrish is not with us this morning. He continues to improve. The pain isn't what it was, but uh, he's still not able to be out and about. And so as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, let's certainly pray for him. Um, I think he has probably moved from... um, the procedure is is uncomfortable to, this is now just frustrating, I'm ready to be out again. So uh, let's pray for him as he deals with that frustration. We know that he would like to be here this morning. And for all of those of you who keep telling me to tell him, we're praying for him, we're praying for him. I know that he appreciates that. Uh, we also want to be in prayer for uh, Miss Gigi and for Ashley Miller. Both of them will be having surgery this week. So let's pray that those procedures are successful and efficient and do everything the doctors are hoping that it will do, and that these ladies can be uh, back on their feet, literally, in, uh, in one case, and, and out and about again. So let's be in prayer for them. Let's also be in prayer for Natalie Wills. In particular, this morning, her grandfather, 92 years old, in the hospital on ICU on a ventilator, and uh, they were determining whether or not to remove him from the ventilator yesterday. I understand that's about to happen at some point. It seems like this morning. So let's pray for Natalie and her family. Um, she's close with her grandpa. And I know she would appreciate your prayers. And of course, we want to pray for our services today, not only here in this room, but down the hall as our junior churches meet. And to praying for those who are meeting in the ministry of the Word of God around the world this morning in our missions family. So let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing. Uh, Jacob, will you come and lead us, please? Let's pray. Our Father, uh, we just... uh... Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, once again, we want to continue to thank you to, for the opportunity to be in your house and, uh, and to worship you and to be together with other believers. Now, uh, there are Christians all over this world and uh, in the Ukraine and in China who have to uh, hide as they're worshiping you and maybe can't meet together like we normally would think of meeting, Lord, but yet they're still faithful to you. But Lord, we want to be gracious for the opportunities that we have here in America and the freedoms we have to enjoy. We don't want to take them for granted, Lord, and we just want to praise you for that this morning, Lord. But we also want to come to you and are thankful that we can come to you with our needs and with our requests, Lord. And I want to pray for pastor this morning as uh, he was not able to be here. And if you, and all that no pastor knows that he likes to be in church. He doesn't like to miss, Lord. And I know uh, that he wishes he could be here, Lord. But we just want to lift him up in prayer that you'd uh, continue to help him recover, Lord, and to get back to full strength and to uh, not have to deal with the pain of a kidney stone or, or the complications from after the procedure, Lord. Uh, continue to go well, that you'd be with Miss Joy also as she takes care of him, Lord, that, uh, that she'd be able to meet his needs and that um, that you would come for both of them during this time and just give him strength to get through it, Lord, and that he can come back to church and be with us soon and I uh, get back to doing what you called him to do, which is lead us and to guide us through your word, Lord. And I pray for uh, Natalie and the Wills family as uh, her grandpa is uh, probably going to be taken off a ventilator, Lord, and, and, and it's always tough to say goodbye um, especially to someone you're close, so close to, Lord. And I just pray uh, that you would uh, comfort them in only the way that you can, Lord, uh, that you, you are, when you were on earth, you knew what it was to suffer loss. You knew what it was to have to say goodbye to someone you love, Lord. And I just pray that you would give them strength and encouragement through this process. I pray that we would be able to encourage them as well, Lord. And I also pray uh, for if there are any of those here this morning who do not know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that you would touch their hearts, Lord. I pray that you would convict their hearts of their need to ha- to to know you and to and to have a relationship with you this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
turn. Number 37. Number 37 in our hymn books. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, and my only res response can be, how great thou art. Let's stand together and sing. Number 37. O oh Lord my God,
mind standing? Turn over just a couple of pages to number 40. This great God is also faithful to us. That's the part that's even harder to believe, isn't it? Great is thy faithfulness. We'll sing the first and the last stanza. Bible says in uh, Proverbs chapter number 28 and uh, verse number 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And you know, there's not a single person, as Bob said, in this room who is perfect. We've all sinned. We've all done things that broke God's laws and his commandments, and we need mercy in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to sing a song entitled Mercy. And I just wanted to share that first with you. Mercy, Lord, have mercy, be merciful to me. All these things within me prove my iniquity. Wash me white and spotless as snow in winter days. Mercy, Lord, have mercy upon my wicked ways. Mercy, Lord, have mercy, be merciful to me. All these saints within me prove my iniquity. Lead me by your spirit to walk in paths of light. Mercy, show more mercy that I may cherish Christ. Mercy, precious mercy, your loyal to your by your loving covenant, we'll never be alone. Hold us close. 
those as children who look to you for care. Mercy, precious mercy, upon beyond compare. Mercy, Lord, have mercy, abundant, rich, and poor. Ceaseless like a fountain, your mercy will endure. Pour out love and kindness upon me lavishly. Mercy, yes, your mercy flows freely down on me. Mercy, yes, your mercy flows freely down on me. Well, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 19. It'll be in Matthew chapter 19, and we'll begin reading in verse number 26. Hope you're all having a good weekend thus far, and got a little cold, but that's okay. Might keep us awake, <laughs> keep me awake. I woke up this morning, Bob was talking about time change, and I knew it was time change. I had went yesterday, and I had talked to... Um, the bus kids reminding them that it was time change so that the bus was going to be coming an hour earlier than normal. And so make sure you're up and ready on time. And I woke up this morning. Thankfully, my phone did time change for me. I woke up this morning. I woke up a little later than I normally would wake up and I woke up tired. And I was wondering to myself, why am I tired? I always wake up at this time, especially on a Sunday. I'm never tired. And then it dawned on me as I was driving to church. Oh, it's actually 8 or 7 30 not 8 30 so that is why i'm tired because i'm never up that early and so so yeah ho hopefully uh maybe you had the same experience and, and you're wondering why you're tired and that's why you're tired and i don't know why we do time change anymore i think we should just go back to leaving it one way all year that would be okay by me i'm not a farmer so it doesn't bother me any but <laughs> but maybe maybe it bothers you but we're in matthew chapter number 19 this morning Matthew number, chapter number 19, and we'll begin reading in verse number 26. And the Bible says, But Jesus beheld them, them, them being his disciples. And he said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. William Carey was known by many as the father of modern missions. He was a missionary to the nation of India, and during his uh, lifetime, he saw many souls come to know Christ. William Carey once said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And as a church family, we are going to ask you, as Bob mentioned last week, to get out of your comfort zone every so often and attempt great things for God. It's our hope as a church staff that we would see God work in miraculous ways this year in 2022. I brought a message uh, about a month ago entitled Overcoming Mediocrity and, and how it's important as a church that we strive for excellence in everything we do because souls depend on it and we cannot afford to be mediocre and then the following week, Bob brought a message on uh, sowing the seed and being faithful to sow, sow the seed in our community and, uh, and around the world as a church. It is our job to spread the gospel to every nation and to every people everywhere, and that includes our city of Fort Mill. And then Jerry brought a message entitled Moving Forward for God. The pastor uh, last week brought a message about the importance of reaching out and being a witness and how we know more than we think we know. And sometimes it's nerve-wracking nerve to be a witness. Sometimes it's nerve-wracking maybe to stand up for Christ because we're afraid of what people might say or that we might not know what the pastor encouraged us last week to remind us, hey, we know more than we think we know. We can be a witness. With God's help, we can be a witness. And over the course of the next several months and over the course of this year as a church, we are going to be doing some things that maybe we haven't done in a long time. 
We're going to be doing Strawberry Festival. We're going to be having a, be, be going into the uh, Fort Mill Fourth of July parade and trying to reach out to our community with the gospel. And on Saturday mornings, where I want to thank those that came out la- this past Saturday in the freezing cold and in the wind. I want to thank those who came out at 10 a.m. to knock doors and just to let the community know, hey, we're here. We care about you. And there's a God that loves you. We're going to be moving forward for God. And I Hope that you will move forward with us, that you will attempt great things for God, because in order to see God grow this church like we want him to, in order to see souls saved and baptized, I love to see souls saved and baptized on a regular basis. But in order to do that, it's going to take us launching out for God and attempting some things that seem to most impossible. You know, the Christian life is not a hard life. It's an impossible life. The things Christ asks us to do, humanly speaking, are not possible. But yet, while with men these things are impossible, Jesus reminds his disciples that with God, all things are possible. God, our God, we serve a God who's not just looking to answer hard prayers this morning. He's looking to answer impossible ones. I want you to just ponder for a moment, what is on your prayer list this year? It is absolutely undeniably impossible. What are you asking God to do? What are you wanting to see in your Christian life that, humanly speaking, cannot be achieved? That only through God will that prayer get answered. I think for many, we tend to live our lives by our own strength and our own power. We don't like to step out of the boat, as Bob talked about last week, because we are afraid of getting to a point where we're not in control. We like to have our hands involved. We like to have that safety net of knowing, well, if I fail, at least I have a backup plan. But God wants to take us to a place where we are wholly dependent on him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if we are living our lives without any faith in God, without any total dependency in God, I just want to say God is not pleased with your life. God wants you to go to places and to do things that are physically impossible for you to do simply so you will learn to trust him more and to build your faith. And as we learn about this impossibility, humanly speaking, but with God, all things are possible, I want to first give you a little bit of context into this text. I don't want to just pull a text out of Scripture and not relay to you the con- uh, context of it. That would be uh, unwise. That would be probably careless. We don't, we, we're not a church that just takes verses and cuts it out and then just pastes it on, on uh, YouTube. We want to be a church that rightly divides the Word of God. And so in Matthew chapter number 19, just to set the context a little bit, uh, Jesus has gone out to a place called Perea. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 19, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Um, It doesn't necessarily say Perea anywhere in the Bible, but when you study historians and when you study context, the place known as Beyond Jordan was often referred to as the place called Perea. It was a place where John the Baptist, if you remember him, spent most of his time preaching and teaching. It was out in the wilderness. It was out uh, away from the city, kind of in the wilderness. And, and so Jesus is in this place called Perea, in this place where John the Baptist spent a lot of time preaching and teaching. And now Jesus begins his ministry of preaching and teaching in that same place where John had once pre- preached and taught. And the Pharisees understood that Jesus was a thorn in their side. He was somebody that was shaking up the balance of powers. He was one that was kind of tearing down the religion, so to speak, and and making it more of a relationship, which was what God always, always intended it to be. And they were trying to find ways, always trying to find ways that they could get rid of Jesus, find ways that they can just get him off the scene, get him out of there. And so in Matthew chapter 19, they come to Perea, the same place John had been, and they thought they could trap Jesus by asking him a very specific question. And that question is found in verse number three. The Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, 
and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? The Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask him a question specifically about divorce. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And the reason they ask him this question is because they had seen earlier that John the Baptist, when he was preaching, when he preached against divorce and Herod didn't like it. And so because John told Herod that it's not lawful for him to have his brother's wife and that that was a fornication, that was a sin against God, Herod had his head cut, cut off and put on a charger. And the Pharisees understood that. And so in this passage of scripture, they come to Jesus and they think if we can just get Jesus to preach one of these crazy messages on divorce and remarriage, if we can just get him to say something crazy and off the wall, maybe Herod will cut off his head too and we'll solve our problems. John will be gone. Jesus will be gone. It'll be all good. We'll go back to business as usual. And so they asked Jesus that question. And And Jesus says in verse number four, and he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And they said unto him, Why did Moses then give a commandment to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. In verse 10, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. The Pharisees think they can trap Jesus. They think they can get him to slip up, do something that will get his head cut off. And I want you to notice firstly that when they asked Jesus a question, Jesus always responded with scripture. And the thing about responding with scripture is no one can, my opinion, you can disagree with. You can't disagree with God's. And even if you do disagree with God, God is always right and we are always wrong. God had created the world. God sets the laws in orbit. God God holds the earth in orbit around the sun and God is the one in control. God is the one we're ultimately going to stand before and give an account. and, And so Jesus responds with scripture. And at Bible Baptist Church, I would encourage you when you are confronted with a tough question, whether it's in your life, whether it's with your children, whether whether it's in your marriage, the answer is always found in Scripture. You look at what's going on in our country. You look around what's going on around the world and you want to know answers. I would encourage you to get in this book because you'll get the right perspective. And Jesus answers them and he says, listen, have you not read? Didn't you read in the Scriptures? that he which made them from the beginning made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be twain or and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. And wherefore what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And quite plainly what Jesus said to the Pharisees is, listen, God made you from the beginning one man and one woman. And God's plan for marriage is for one man and for one woman to become one flesh and one flesh for life. And what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Now I want to preface this, okay? There are, I understand there are people in this room who have been divorced. I understand that there are people in this room who come from blended families where your parents were divorced and got remarried and, and, and they loved you and they raised you right. And, and I want to say first off that I am thankful we serve a God who doesn't cast us aside, even though we sometimes screw up his will. I want to say that we serve a God who understands we're imperfect. We serve a God who understands that we're sinners and we live in a broken world and sometimes things happen and sometimes divorces happen and sometimes things are unrepairable, human speaking, and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to restore us and use us and guide us. And he doesn't say, oh, you got divorced, you're no more 
fit to be used by me. He says, no, come in, give me your burdens. I'll give you rest and I'll use you today. There are, there are Christians in this room who are divorced, who God uses greatly every day. There are Christians in this room who are divorced, who are like family to me. And I know God's in their marriage. I know God's guiding them. I know God's leading them. God doesn't just write you off, but what God's saying, and I think all the people that are divorced in this room would agree with me, is that divorce is not something you want to go through. It's not the intent. It's not how it was made to be. Anybody who's ever been through a divorce knows that divorce is tough. Sometimes it gets ugly. Sometimes it's hard on the kids. And God wants to say today, hey, listen, if you're married, it's God's intention that you stay with your wife and your husband. No matter what the problems come, you say, well, we're having marriage trouble today. <laughs> There's a lot of people like that. And I don't have all the answers. I don't know how, I don't know how to <laughs> help someone who's in an abusive situation. I don't know how to help someone whose spouse cheated on. I, I don't have the, I lack the words to be able to comfort them in that situation. But I know this, the only way a marriage is going to last is if God's in the middle of it. In, in the Jewish culture, and during my studies, I read this, in Jewish culture, you could divorce your wife for anything. Uh, uh wrote about Jewish culture and divorce, and they said, that in, while divorce was frowned upon in Jewish culture, it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife if his wife overcooked their meal. <laughs> now, just imagine that, ladies, okay? Imagine you come home, your husband comes home, you've prepared this meal for him, and he decides it's a little overcooked, and so he writes you a get, which is what the Jews believe is their bill of divorcement. He writes you a get and hands it to you and say, I divorce you. And you say, what for? Or you burnt my dinner, so I divorce you, and I have legal grounds to divorce you today. And I'm, I'm thankful that it doesn't work the other way, because if, if, if Brianna could divorce me just for burning food, we'd be divorced, or I'd just never cook because I'd burn everything I cook. And Jesus steps in, and, and you got to understand, Jesus is stepping into that same culture where divorce is just, for whatever reason, you can do it whenever you want. It's a, it's, if things get tough, you can just walk out. And the Jews had built up this system where it, they have, were justifying all these reasons to d get rid of this woman because they didn't like her and to just, uh, just get another woman and they thought it was okay. There's no problem with it. And, and Jesus steps into that culture and he says, no, 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 no. That's not God's intention. From the beginning, God made you one man and one woman for one lifetime. And what God has put together, let no man put asunder. The divorce is not an option. And I think about America who, I read a statistic the other day, about 50% of marriages in America end in divorce. I drove down the interstate the other day and I saw a billboard that said, oops, with two wedding rings. Maybe you've seen it too. The first time I ever saw that billboard was in California when I went out for college and I thought, well, this is California. That makes sense. It's never going to happen in South Carolina, but it has come to South Carolina. And the sign says, oops, with two wedding rings and underneath it says, life's too short, get a divorce. And we're living in a culture today that views marriage so carelessly and casually. And a culture today that says, listen, when things get tough, just walk away. When there's problems, when there's arguing, when there's infighting, when, when there's things that need to be worked out, you don't have to stick with it. You don't have to stay with it. You can just walk away. And, Jesus want, and I just want to tell you, God wants to say, no, that's not the plan. Stick it out. You say, but you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what he did to me. You don't understand what she said about me. You don't understand uh, the problems that we have within our families. You don't understand uh, the, the problems that came because we believe differently and all this sorts of stuff of things and we just can't work it out. And I want to tell you with men, you can't. By yourself, you can't. There are problems that happen in life. There are problems that result in a sin curse world that you physically are not able to overcome. You can't restore your marriage on your own. You can't fix the pain you caused her, but God can. You see, marriage is impossible without God. And I understand there are a lot of people that 
don't believe in God and they've been married 50, 60 years. And I'm thankful for that. We rejoice with that. Even though they don't know God, let's rejoice when marriages last. But as a whole, marriages are impossible. You need God to step in in your marriage. You need God in the middle of it. You need God leading you. And Jesus steps into that culture and condemns divorce and says, listen, with me, you can do it. With me, you can make it. Then I want you to notice, secondly, after Jesus has given this whole uh, discourse on divorce and remarriage, and he said, that's not God's plan. It was never God's plan. Only because of the hardness of your heart did Moses give a writing of, of divorcement. But from the beginning, it was not so. Um, in, uh, g- going into verse number 13, Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 13. The Bible says, after Jesus has given this whole context on divorce, then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuke them. So Jesus has just confronted the Pharisees. They couldn't trap him. They walk away because they're angry. They couldn't get his head cut off over divorce. And now Jesus has these little children brought to him. And and I, I don't know, when I view this, I just picture Jesus sitting, and he's got kids sitting in his lap, and playing with his hair and maybe uh, poking him or coughing on him or whatever kids do. I mean, kids, kids do some crazy stuff. And, and Jesus is just enjoying this time with these children and, and, just, uh, and just probably playing with them, maybe even playing peekaboo. I don't know, but the Bible doesn't tell us. But he's got all these kids all over him. And here come the disciples. They had just said, God, it's not good that we should be married. And Jesus rebuked them. And now here come these little kids and they come and shoot, shoot, get out of here. Leave Jesus alone. He, can't, he, don't, he don't have time for you. you stop bothering Jesus. He's got more important things to do. Get him out. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Look with me at verse number 14. But Jesus said, suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of God. Jesus got all these children leaning on him. And and like so many Christians today, we view the children ministry as a babysitting ministry. We view the bus bus kids as as just people we got to watch for like 30 minutes and then send them on their merry way. And they're they're not somebody we want to invest time in. But yet God says, no, no, let the little children come. This is the kingdom of God. I want the children to come unto me. I want them to be around me. I want them to know me. One of the reasons, Jesus, one of the reason God hates divorce is because of what it does to children. You hear people say all the time, "Well, the children did pretty good through the divorce. You know, they're, they're handling it okay." And children are resilient. I mean, children, when you're put in that position, you have no choice but to handle it. Any say in what your parents do as a kid, you're just along for the ride. And Jesus, I I believe Jesus is looking at the kids. He had just talked about divorce, and I believe he's looking at these kids, and he's burdened with compassion on them because they're living in a society where their parents are just getting divorced left and right, and they're growing up in that society. And he's thinking to himself, look at what they're going through. I think he, he's thinking about Malachi chapter, chapter number one, where, he, where, where God says, for this reason, the, for, the, for the Lord God of Israel saith that he hateth the putting away. He says in Malachi chapter number um, two, actually, he said, did not he make one? Yet, he, yet had he the residue of the spirit and wherefore one, or why did God give marriage for one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with his wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith he hateth the putting away. God loves children. And we ought to love children like God loves children. Marriage is impossible without God, but you know what else is impossible without God? Raising godly children raising the children that come up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, raising children that stay in church, raising children that do right, raising children that will one day uh, go to heaven. 
You look at our society today and you say, it's impossible to raise godly kids today. I mean, look at all the influences in their life. Look at the technology that they have. Look at the phone system. Look at the, look at the TV shows that they're now, even on Disney Channel, are making for our children and the stuff they're teaching our kids. And there's nothing safe for kids anymore. And how can we as Christian parents, how can we as, as, as a church raise children that love God in the midst of this society that pushes anti-godliness, in the midst of this society that pushes transgenderism at a very early age in the midst of a society where porn pornography is shown everywhere in the midst of a society that says there is no God. You just came from nothing. You're, you're a lump of cells that random chance came and there's no purpose for your life. And you're sitting there as a parent saying, what do I do? I can't let them go to school because of what they teach them at school. I can't let them hang out with this friend down the street because of the influence they have and what they might see while they're over there. And how can I raise godly children today? I want to tell you, God says with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Hey, parents, are you struggling to raise your kids? Walk with God. Listen, kids have their own choices to make, but if you raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, they won't forget that. They may disagree. They may go their own way for a little bit, but they will remember what they were taught as a child. They'll know right from wrong. They'll know, hey, there was a church one time that told me if I lived this way, if I didn't have God, I wasn't going to get into heaven. And in the back of their mind, while they're sinning, they will know that. With God, it's possible to raise godly children. With God, it's possible to see your children stay pure till marriage. With God, it's possible to see your children love the Lord. With God, it's possible to see your children be witnesses for the Lord. With God, it's possible to raise a bus ministry that is thriving where kids get saved and where kids' lives get changed. I mean, sometimes you look at the kids on our bus and you think, man, how in the world could God ever save them? Look at the life they come from. I mean, they got parents that don't even pay them any attention when they're at the house. Their parents don't care what they do. Their parents don't raise them, right? Their parents even cuss them out sometimes. And no wonder why they act this way. And and we only get one hour a week with them. How are we going to make a difference? And I want to say to all my master club teachers and all my junior church teachers, which are down the hall, maybe they'll listen to it later, but I want to say to you, listen, with God, you can make a difference in those kids' lives. And even if we just save one kid, even if we just change one kid, life is worth it. When one sinner comes to repentance, they are, there is rejoicing in heaven, just for one. We ought to rejoice when one person gets saved. I think sometimes, because we are a society that likes numbers and growth, I think sometimes when we only see one kid or one, one family come and get saved or join the church, sometimes we're disappointed. Like, God, is that it? Like, we worked all year, and only one person is getting baptized. We only had to fill the baptistry once, and we get disappointed, but... Why don't we just start rejoicing when God changes a life? That's a miracle in itself. Lives don't change on their own. They only change by the power of God. And God says, listen, he wants to tell some of you parents today, listen, don't give up. Don't throw in a towel. Don't get weary and well-doing. Just trust God and do what you know is right. Do what God tells you. Raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and he will not fail you. Lastly, I want you to notice that not only is marriage impossible without God, not only is raising your children impossible without God, but salvation is impossible without God. The disciples have had a really bad day up until this point. The Pharisees come and talk about divorce, and Jesus said, it's not lawful for you to put your wife away for any reason. And the disciples say, well, Lord, if that's the case, and we just probably shouldn't get married because that's just way too difficult. If we can't get divorced for anything, we just might as well just stay single forever. And Jesus says, no, we, it's God's plan for you to be married. It, got, it, it was not good for me and to be alone. I want you to have a wife. I want you to have a help me. And so God rebukes them. And then these children come to Jesus and Jesus is enjoying these children and, and talking with these children and teaching these children and disciples come and get them out because they think they're a nuisance. They think they're a problem and they shoo into children out and Jesus rebukes them again. And the children come to me. They're the kingdom of God. They're the future. They're who I want. They're, they're who I want to reach. And now in verse number 16, the Bible says, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit? may have eternal Here comes this rich, righteous guy 
And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what do I need to do to get eternal life? The Bible says in verse number 17, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Jesus says, listen, there's none good. There's none righteous, no, not one. Only God's good, which, by the way, that is why Jesus can be called good, because Jesus is God. And he says unto them, but if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. And so here's this rich, righteous man, a Jewish man, and he says, I, I, I believe he would come to Jesus when Jesus says, keep the commandments. He's probably thinking in his head, well, which commandments? There's like 613 of them. And not even counting the oral commandments that the Pharisees have added on top of the written commandments. I mean, the Pharisees, the, the law says in the Old Testament that we are to keep Sabbath day holy. But the Pharisees say that if we just have like a tack in our shoe and we walk on the Sabbath day, we're carrying a burden and now we ought to be stoned. And so there's all these commandments. It's hard to keep track of all these commandments in the Jewish commandments. And he says, there's all of these things. So which commandments do you want me to keep? And Jesus says in... um. In verse 18, he saith unto him, which? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, and thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? He says, Jesus, I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I've never stolen. I've honored my father and my mother. I was a good Jewish guy. I, I've done all those things. I've grown up keeping the law. I've gone, grown up going to the temple and making sacrifices. I've done all these things. So what am I lacking? What's keeping me? And Jesus says in verse, um, verse number 20, the young man said unto him, or no, sorry, verse 21, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that, that thou hast and give to the poor treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, before we get a little bit farther in this, I want to say that Jesus is not teaching that you have to sell everything you have to get saved. Because some people will view it that way. They'll view it as Jesus telling him that you can earn your way to salvation by selling your stuff to the poor and doing charitable deeds and all this stuff. But the Bible says otherwise. The Bible is very clear. You, no man can earn their way to heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Titus chapter number 1 and verse number 3 says, Not by works of righteousness, not by works, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. There's a lot of people out here this morning who are trying to earn their way to heaven. They think if I can just give enough money to charities, God will let me in. If I can just be nice enough, God will let me in. If I could just be good enough, if I could just go to church enough times, maybe you're sitting here today and the reason you came to church is because you feel like if you're not in church, God won't let you into heaven. And I just want to tell you, there's no one that can earn their way to heaven. There's none righteous, no, not one. God's standard for heaven is perfection. Anybody in this room perfect? If you're trying to earn your way to heaven today, I just want to tell you, you're going to find out really quickly it's not possible. Every day you think thoughts that you shouldn't, and that's a sin. You can't even help it. It just happens. And sins just mount up. And I believe some people that think their good's going to outweigh their bad are going to get to heaven, and they're going to find out really quick that my bad is way more than my good. Even the things I thought weren't bad were actually bad. And so now, now I'm hopeless. Jesus wasn't saying you can earn your way to heaven. What he was telling this man was, listen, if you, if you think you got it, then sell everything you have and come after me. And he said that because he knew that this man was covetous. And in the Ten Commandments, if you know them, the Bible says, thou shalt not covet. And the Bible says in uh, verse 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He said, listen, I've kept all these commandments. I'm good there. And Jesus says, well, what about this one? 
And he went away sorry because he knew that he hadn't kept that one. In another passage of scripture, Jesus said, if you offend in one point of the law, you have offended in all. There's not a soul in this room who can say, I've done everything right. I'm imperfect. I can't make it to heaven. And Jesus says that. And I want you to notice the disciples' response because this is a response that sometimes we get. They say in verse um, 25, when his disciples heard it, or actually, let's start in uh, verse number 23, because the rich man has now gone away, and Jesus now turns to his disciples, and he says unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, "Then who then can be saved? Jesus said, listen, it's harder for a rich person. It's it's easier, actually. It's easier to take a camel and put it through a little eye of a needle. Y'all know what I'm talking about with the eye of the needle. Jesus said, it's it's easier to put a camel through that than for a rich man to get saved. And the disciples are thinking, well, then who can get saved? If that's easier, then no one can get saved. There's no way possible anyone can get saved. And then immediately after that, Jesus says, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's impossible to get to heaven without God. The Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son hath not life. For whosoever shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Only through the blood of Christ can anyone reach heaven. Only through turning from their own desires, turning from their own ways of getting to heaven. It it takes a person saying, God, I can't get there on my own. I'm not good enough on my own. I can't do it anymore. But God, I'm turning to you and I'm trusting you and you alone. That's the only person that's getting to heaven. Salvation is impossible without God. And you know, I want Bible Baptist Church to be a church that believes with God all things are possible. I want Bible Baptist Church to be a church full of parents who believe with God I can raise my children to do what's right. I want Bible Baptist Church, I want me and Bob to be people who believe that with God we can see Fort Mill reach for Christ. And what's our motivation for this? Why should we walk with God? Why should I give my life to God? Why should I surrender to him? I want you to notice three quick things from the life of Enoch, and we'll be done. Enoch, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number five, was a man who walked with God. If you'll flip with me to Genesis chapter number five. In verse number 24, Genesis chapter number 5 and verse number 24, the Bible says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God all the days of his life, and he never saw death because God took him. Hebrews uh, chapter number 11, verse number 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because he had tr- God had translated him, For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And when I was pondering in my studies, why should we walk with God? The one person that stood out to me to walk with God was Enoch. And I was trying to figure out what motivated him to do it. Why did Enoch walk with God? And I want you to notice, firstly, the first motivation to walking with God should be your family. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 5, In verse number 21, and Enoch lived 60 and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. The first time the Bible ever says Enoch walked with God was after he had a son. I believe Enoch one day at 65 years of age walked into his tent, walked into his home to find his wife beaming with joy. She got this smile on her face. She's sitting over in the corner, and Enoch looks at his wife, and he says, why are you smiling about me? And she says, well, I got something to show you. And Enoch 
like every good husband says, what did you buy now? <laughs> uh, we can't afford anything, honey. Uh, what, what did you buy? And she's just smiling and she looks at him and she pulls out a little baby bib and she says, you're going to be a dad. And I think something changed in Enoch that day when he found out he was going to be a father. I'm not a father. I have a father, but I'm not a father. Right now, it's just me, my wife, and my dog. <laughs> and I, honestly, I, I can say I, w- I would be happy if I had a kid today. I'm, I, I would be. But I'm also content with the stage of life I'm in. I'm content with where me and my wife are in our relationship. And I don't tend to necessarily think about children too much, like having my own, but occasionally I will. And when I start to think about having a little girl of my own or a little boy of my own, I just got to be honest, that thought terrifies me. It terrifies me. Because I don't know how to be a dad. I think I do. I mean, I, I, when I was a child, I told my parents the right way to raise me. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know how to be a father. And every time I think about having a kid, every time I go to God and say, God, if I'm going to have a child, you better be with me. Because I don't want to mess up that kid's life. I don't want them to be born into a world and not know you because they're watching me. I don't want to raise a kid who ends up going to hell because they had a father who didn't model a life that walked with God. And I pray, God, you better help me raise that kid. You better be in my marriage with my wife or we're not going to make it. God, help me. Be with me. And I'm not even a father yet. And I can just imagine when y'all had kids, for those of you who had kids, I can just imagine you understood, I need God if this is going to work. And I believe Enoch understood that. He started thinking about being a dad and what it was going to take and how he was under-equipped for it. And he understood and he went to God and said, God, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to raise a child, you better be with me. His family motivated him every single day to be right with God. I think of my... My dad, I don't know all of his motivations, but I know this one motivation for him to stay in church and to be faithful and to walk with God is because he wants us to live that way too. And why would we, he expect us to live that way if he's not? And one motivation to walk with God and be right with God and walk with him every single day is because you got little children whose lives are in the balance. And if they don't see a family and the parents that model a life with God, they are not going to turn out for God. But I want you to notice, secondly, I believe his second motivation was coming judgment. The Bible says he had a son and he named his son Methuselah. And, you know, names in the Bible are kind of crazy. They're weird names. But names in the Bible had meaning. And the name Methuselah means when he dies, it will come. Now imagine having a name like that. When you die, it's coming. (laughs) And I believe at 65 years of age, God says, uh, Enoch, you're going to have a son. And when your son dies, the flood's coming. And I believe God revealed to Enoch of his plans for coming judgment on the world in the the event of a worldwide flood. And for the rest of Enoch's life, Enoch knew when my son dies, judgment's coming to the earth. When my son dies, God's wrath is going to be poured out on this earth. And I believe in that moment, Enoch's only hope was, God, please don't let my family be in that judgment. I don't want my son to have to go through the wrath of God. I don't want my grandchildren to have to be destroyed in a worldwide flood. And I believe Enoch every day woke up knowing, listen, I better model a life with God because if I don't, they're going to be judged. You know, there's a judgment coming. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And one motivation for you to walk with God is that one day God is coming back to earth and he's going to judge every single person. And if your family's not walking with God, if they don't know God, they will go through that wrath. And they, and they will hear God say, depart from me, for I never knew you, and be cast into the lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. 
This isn't fun and games. This is serious stuff, and we ought to walk with God because I doubt anybody in this room wants their family to go to hell. And then lastly, I believe Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God because he had a desire to know and fellowship with God. Paul said in Philippians uh, chapter number three, he says that it was his goal in life that he might know God in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And I believe Enoch's goal in life was to know God also. You got to remember people lived a long time in Enoch's day. And when Enoch was alive, you know who else was alive? Adam. Adam was still alive when Enoch was alive. And I believe uh, Enoch probably heard the stories from Adam of what it was like in the Garden of Eden, what it was like to have God walk with them in the cool of the day, walk with them and to just be in this perfect atmosphere. And I believe Enoch hears all these stories and, and he went away saying, I want to know God like that. I want to have God in my life like Adam had God in his life. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know God personally. And that motivated Enoch every single day to walk with God. I don't know what your heart's desire is. I don't know what your goal is in life, but I can say personally, my goal is to know God. I don't want him to just be some theoretical person I hear about in church. I want to know that the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob is the same God I serve today. I want to know that the God who raised up Bible Baptist Church is the God who can still work in my life today. I want to know that the God who took Paul Chapel, which is the college I went to, and took 15 souls and grew it into thousands of souls that are a church still going today that see people saved and baptized every single day. I want to know that that God can still do the same thing here through me. I want to know that God can still do miracles. I don't want to just... Read the stories. And the only way God's going to do a miracle in my life is if I'm walking with him. Do you want to know God? Or you just want to read some book about him? And I understand it's not some book, it's his book. But I want to experience God personally. And the only way to do that is to every single day wake up and walk with God. Matthew 19, 26 is our text, and Jesus said that with men, this is impossible. With men, listen, today with men, it's not possible to be married long term. With men, it's not possible to raise your children correctly. With men, it's not possible to build a church. With men, it's not possible to see souls saved. But with God, all things are possible. Miss Gwen will come. As she comes, I just want you to... I want to challenge you with this. Let's be a church that lives by faith. Let's be a people that despite the circumstances, despite anything going on in the world, believe wholeheartedly that with God, all things are possible. Let's stand together. The altar's open. Perhaps the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning and you realize I need to put some trust in him that I've not been doing. I want to see him work in my life and my family like that. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You don't have the hope, the confidence that if you were to die today, that your soul would immediately be in heaven. We would invite you to come. We have folks that can pray with you, can show you from the Word of God how you can be saved. If you're a believer and you need to make a decision, the altar is open for you as well. We're singing 252. If you need the book, come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy, mercy with the Lord. Only trust him. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him. Glad you were here this morning. I want to encourage you, if you didn't get a bulletin on the way in, please pick one up on the way out. There's important information, like, for instance, 
Tonight, before the evening service, there will be a meeting for all of the parents of our teenagers. Uh, make sure that you're here for that. There's some important news for you ladies. This is the last day, I think, to make your reservations for the ladies' meeting on April 30th. Uh, there's information about that out on the back table. You can register your place online. And then next Sunday morning, we're going to begin taking pictures for our new church directory. Who are we taking pictures of? Yes, if you attend Bible Baptist Church, come, be ready to smile. We're going to do this for three consecutive Sunday mornings, so the sooner you get it over with, the sooner you get it over with, okay? And we'll have more specific directions. So come one of those Sundays, dressed up, ready to go, bring your family. We're not trying to sell you pictures, okay? Nobody's going to come knocking on your door. We have a wonderful, no, none of that. You don't get the pictures. They're for the directory, all right? So come and smile nice. Thank you so much for being here today. We'll see you tonight, 5.30, if you're a parent of a teenager, choir at 4.30, but you knew that already, and 6 o'clock for the rest of us, and we'll see what else the Lord has for us today. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you work, and we know that we are confronted every day with things that to us are just not possible. But we're so thankful that you work, and you work in spite of us, you work through us, you work for our own good. And so, Lord, we pray this week that we would put our trust in you to see you do those things in our lives, in our homes, our families, in our children, and in our church. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.